spend a few minutes talking about how to collect money on private construction contracts in the state of California. How do we collect money generally? How can we make it more efficient for architects, engineers, contractors, subcontractors, suppliers, and others to get paid what they're owed? Well, the first thing is, on the business side, you wanna make sure that your invoices are on time. They're sent out in time, they're clear, they're um, easy to understand, and also send out a statement. Statement meaning, here's the compilation of charges in the past, here are the charges that are being assessed in the current invoice, what is owed, and what credits have been uh, attributed to the owner. Now, this will be very helpful because somebody processing an invoice will then be able to look at the statement and know exactly what's been paid and what has not. In addition, there are so many ways to get paid in the construction industry, and usually we ignore many of them. For example, we simply rely upon a check. You know, somebody may not have the money in their account at the moment to pay a check, but a check is also a slow way to go and allows people to have sort of an excuse as the saying goes. So instead, think about a wire transfer, which only requires a routing number and a checking account account number, as well as banking information for the other side to pay you immediately. And those will usually clear within 24 hours. The other thing is, why not use credit cards? An awful lot of people use them, and many construction contractors, owners, and others have a, a credit card that may go up to twenty-five dollars to $50,000. And again, that will usually clear the next day. So again, the first thing is have the proper accounting methods set up and have ways that make it easy for the individual to pay you. How about a phone call? How about a personal meeting? How about basically sitting down with the individual and, and asking them across the table, what can you pay now? These things can be done long before you have to start some sort of legal action or threatening action. And of course, a letter, then a letter escalated perhaps by a, a, a law firm in a demand letter may also shake loose payments that erode. But what happens if none of those things have worked? Well, in California, we have several weapons to help you. The first one is, in private projects, we have a series of prompt payment laws. And those start with uh, the Civil Code, Section 8800, and that is a progress payment. And generally, progress payments have to be made within 30 days. How about the retention? Well, at the end of a job, the retention on private projects should be paid under 8812 within 45 days. And finally, progress payments along the way under Business and Professions Code uh, 718.5. But as a general matter, those rules are what you should expect to be paid. And if you don't get paid within that period of time, generally there are interest uh, charges up to 2% uh, per month penalties in some cases, and attorney's fees as well. So there's some great weapons to use in collections. Now in the past, we've had a series of issues with regard to whether or not there's a good faith dispute. And along the way, those good faith disputes have caused many uh, clients to say, well, I don't have to pay it. I have something, for example, that's extraneous to the retention. Well, that's no longer the case. In a recent Supreme Court case, it became clear that the dispute, good faith dispute, has to be about the retention, not about something else on the project or some other claim. So that's the way that retention can be held. And in fact, you can withhold up to 150% if in fact that's the uh, applicable uh, good faith dispute. Now, what about taking it to the next level? Obviously, there are additional remedies available. It's in the California Constitution, actually, that mechanics, meaning people that work on commercial or, or residential properties have a right to be paid and they have a right to lien the property just as if they'd be leaning if they were a bank doing a deed of trust. So they have that right and most of the time though, except for uh, laborers and people that work for wages, generally you have to do a preliminary notice and you have to do the preliminary notice within 20 days of starting work or it will only go back to the 20 days before you file that preliminary notice with, with appropriate people. In addition, once you get into the project, you have the right of a mechanics lien. But again, depending on whether you're a subcontractor, a supplier, a mechanic, or a general contractor, you, you may have a problem with violating those uh, periods if you don't stay on top of it. So you, you need to know that. And generally it's 30, 60, in some cases 90 days, but then you have situations where you can extend it, something called a uh, notice of credit, where you can extend it another 90 days before you have to file a lawsuit.
Once you filed your preliminary notice, you do your work through the course of the project. Then, if you're not paid, you have the right to a mechanics lien. The mechanics lien is limited in time when you can file it. Depending on whether you're a supplier, a subcontractor, a general contractor, it may be 30, 60, or perhaps 90 days after the time you've ceased work or substantial completion of the project. So these timelines are very, very important. And they can be foreshortened if the owner files a notice of succession of labor or if there's a notice of substantial completion that can shorten those time periods. So again, don't assume that you have 60 or 90 days. You may have substantially less. Once you file the mechanics lien, if you've done it properly and you've gotten the proper notices to the various parties that deserve those notices, then you have a fixed period of time of 90 days to file your mechanics lien lawsuit. In other words, a mechanics lien to foreclose on the property, to essentially sell it at an auction, and then get your uh, payment out of that amount. Now that can be extended by a, a notice of credit, which is a form you can fill out if the owner agrees, and extend it an extra 90 days, but no longer than that. So there is a possibility of extending it beyond 90 days, but you have to be on that as well. Finally, um, within all of these statutes, there are opportunities to structure your contract so that you have a more immediate, quicker remedy. One of them is to put an arbitration clause in for disputes under, say, $100,000. And you can put, for example, the American Arbitration Association, an expedited arbitration provision in your contracts. You may not want that for a big dispute, but you may want it for a quick dispute where you want to get your money as soon as possible. And your mechanics lien lawsuit needs to be filed and at the same time file a notice to stay of that lawsuit so you can proceed with your arbitration. The second thing to consider is an attorney's fees clause. And again, I think the attorney's fees clauses can become uh, a clause that ends up driving the lawsuit. But if the amount of the claim is under $100,000, you can say that that could be subject to a uh, attorney's fees clause and, and collect your, your uh, attorney's fees on that basis. Why not have an attorney's fees clause for much larger disputes? Because what will happen is the attorney's fees will become the, being the most important thing in the lawsuits and uh, not the underlying dispute that you have. So again, these are tools that you may use to get paid more quickly on private construction projects.